Beth Hatt. I'm a professor in the Department of Educational Administration and Foundations at Illinois State University. And um, tonight, what we are going to be talking about um, in a variety of ways is what it means to rethink equity, particularly in this um, context that we're in, both with uh, COVID and then also with um, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others and the protests that have occurred as a result of it. And part of this, uh, the way this came about were some conversations we've been having about the ways that one, um, COVID reveals a lot of inequities in schools um, and makes them even more glaringly apparent than what they were prior to COVID. And, um, and at the same time, the ways that things with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd revealed inequities in the criminal justice system <clears throat> in particular. So, um, so then what does it mean to do equity work within this context? And what are the ways that equity can get watered down to mean, let's make sure just that people feel included versus how do we really change systems and structures to ensure that people do have more access and opportunity rather than um, the change being just symbolic. Um, and so, and also then how does, how does equity work? What are ways that potentially it's been co-opted um, to be embedded in notions of whiteness? And also um, how does equity work connect to anti-colonization or decolonization in schools? Like how, how do we do that as well? And how does it connect? So what we're gonna talk about tonight is related to that. And each person is sort of taking their own take. Um, and I will let each person jump in and introduce themselves and sort of share briefly what they're gonna talk about tonight and how it relates to notions of equity and rethinking equity. Hi, good evening. My name is Sonia Ruiz. In my role, I'm an administrator, and when you're an administrator in the school system, you really have a lot of power. A lot of times you, you think you don't, and you say there are these policies or these programs, or this is just the way we've done things, um, but really you're in a position where you can impact the policies and programs that are within your school, your community, um, and even at a legislative um, level. So I'm hoping that through my talk, I can walk you through so that you can start rethinking, how do you do school now? What programs do you have? You know, um, like Dr. Hot said, um, currently we have COVID, but that's not just it. These inequities existed before COVID was there. Um, they just brought it out to light what we've been fighting all along. So how do you schedule your students? What programs do you have? Who are you including? Who are you excluding? And hopefully you'll have a new lens to look through and help you make better decisions to change some of the programs or things that you have now or make new ones. So hopefully tonight you'll get some direction on how to do that. Thank you. I'm going next. I can go next. <laughs> Um, I'm Dr. Cindy Alvarez. I'm a bilingual school psychologist, um, worked in a couple of different districts. Um, but I think for my role, as my role, you know, I also work in the school systems. Um, and then my thing is the inequities among like mental health and social emotional, um, in particular to with black and brown students. Um, so I'll be talking about decolonizing social emotional learning. You know, what's interesting is kind of what Sonia mentioned, you know, these inequities have been there. Um, but then just with COVID, you know, we've seen how basic needs of our students haven't been met. Um, and then how certain people or certain districts perceive what is the, you know, what is essential, what is critical, um, and how the social emotional learning either one hasn't been focused and completely just disregarded and there's been that high focus on the academics. And then you go to the other extreme of some districts where who've already had social emotional learning embedded within their systems, but not really thinking critically of how that social emotional learning curriculum might either be used as a weapon to either silence or continue to oppress our black and brown students. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and as well as how as an educator, either as a teacher or either as like a school psych or principal, or even higher up in the administration, how do you develop, you know, or choose 
um, curriculum that does not come from a package little book uh, because you won't find it that way. But how do you, you know, select that curriculum uh, and for it to be really centered around students' voices and really from that decolonization aspect, um, using their lived experiences to really culturally validate them and affirm them and for them to feel liberated um, so part of my role, I do a lot of groups, um, so I'll be sharing some stories and that's part of my even my ways of being uh, as a woman of color, um, because that's how you deliver that social emotional learning. So um, I will pass it down to either Jorge or Kim, whoever wants to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll share. Um, so I just want to build off of what both Sonia and Cindy and Dr. Hat said about um, that the inequities were there before, right? And so this is not anything, we just have to help work through them in a different way. So sometimes it was easy to maybe cover or um, put a Band-Aid on an inequity because we could see the parents in person or we could see the students in person. And then when we've lost that opportunity maybe to be in person or be as close or do things the way we've done them in the past, now we've had, we've, we can see where those inequities were before and how we were making these adjustments to help, but it wasn't a systemic change, right? It was in the moment an individual change. So um, what I am talking about is community-oriented practices. Um, as a multilingual uh, coordinator, part of my role and one of my favorite parts of my role is that I get to work with the families and the students and the teachers and just bringing everybody together. Um, and so what this has shown me and I think shown us, um, the pandemic and also, you know, the, the social um, events that we've mentioned and more that have happened since this summer um, that are affecting our students and our families, both emotionally and financially, um, is we need to have ways and systems in place to support our families. So I'll be sharing some of the things that I've done um, since the pandemic started from working with local organizations to provide rental assistance, um, utilities assistance, um, working with you know, our school staff, um, just even today, for example, um, helping a family problem solve um, a health issue and helping them get to where they need to, need to be to get the health care that they need. Um, but I also want to talk about this idea of the computers and how we've come into these spaces that have been private spaces. We've entered into all of our families' homes. And, you know, on one hand, we can say that well, they invited us into their homes and, and maybe many did, but we just also kind of forced ourselves into everybody's home um, and asked them to share. And so I think it's important too that we're being really mindful about how we, um, how we connect uh, to families and how we respect um, the fact that we have entered into their homes. How do we be respectful of that? How do we make sure we're um, being supportive and not surveilling our families through this? And then also, how can we use this as an opportunity? How can we use um, this weird time to bring families into learning in a way that we have never had the opportunity before, right? Because now uh, maybe mom is listening to our social studies lesson while she's getting dinner ready and she's probably got something she wants to add, right? And so now we've got this opportunity where we can start bringing our families into the classroom, so to speak, um, in a way that we've never had access to before. So those will be the things I'll be covering tonight. My name is uh, Jorge Sanchez. Uh, I'm an administrator, but more importantly, I'm a, I'm a brown man who uh, attended public education in Chicago. Um, so my experiences are what drive my work. Um, I experienced inequities um, in, in our educational system. I experienced um, the oppression of my culture, right? And a forceful assimilation. So my work really centers on providing um, students an avenue by which to amplify their voice. Um, the session that um, 
that 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 I'm holding is actually um, around that around the work that that has been done um, to try to provide students that vehicle by which to reclaim um, their identity that for um, so many years has been um, oppressed right through uh, through colonized uh, uh, educational practices um, and we're going to talk about how these systems keep on perpetuating these ideologies right uh, from um, a building perspective and from a classroom perspective, and how can we empower our students to um, to fight these injustices.